Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's 67th program with the Let's Get Real program with our famous host, Coach Menachem Bernfeld. And again, I want to thank everybody for coming here every Sunday night. Again, I always start off every week start thanking uh, all the viewers for helping this platform become so big and exploding and posting on their WhatsApp statuses and telling their friends about it. And Baruch Hashem, we're getting tremendous feedback over the years. Already we're in the years and it keeps on growing. And we really appreciate that. And again, at least if you can't make it the week, let friends know about what's, you know, who's on and uh, join. It's been a tremendous, tremendous growth and we have a lot to talk about tonight. All those people that are watching this share on the YouTube, the replay, click on the like button for Coach Menachem and the subscribe button so we could uh, make all that money from YouTube, like Rabbi Manus Freeman, the YouTube rabbi, and uh, keep continue growing. I want to first start off with all our advertising sponsors, thanking first the Lakewood Scoop here in Lakewood for promoting us here. Special thank you to Rabbi and Nifin Chazak. Chazak offers programming from all. If anybody wants any more information, please go to chazak.org. Special thank you tonight to Mrs. Mika Sofer for posting it on COL Live. And a special thank you to Mrs. Haile Kaufman and Shmuel Summer from JCN Jewish Content Network for always promoting us across all the, 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 the Jewish digital platforms. Again, for anybody who's here the first time, every Sunday night at 10 o'clock on this Zoom ID, 645-572-066, we have different shiurim on different topics, different rabbis, different therapists, and it's been dynamic. And tonight is shear number 67. So we've been around for a while and it's only growing. Next Sunday, let's do the shear screen. Okay. Next Sunday, August 8th, we have an amazing share um, with Dr. the world famous Dr. David Lieberman. He wrote tons of books. He's a genius. Um, and um, we're very, very honored to have him. We're going to be discussing how to deal with difficult people and personalities and tactics and tools, how to apply them in real life scenarios. I'm sure everybody could relate to that in some form or another. So it should be an amazing program. Please tell people to join and it should be amazing. Tonight we have the schuss of having the world famous Rabbi Manus Friedman coming back here by popular demand for a second time. Rabbi Friedman, if you came back a second time, it's a good, it's a good sign, right? So Baruch Hashem, the oil wants you back and we're happy you're back. And uh, I want to start off first with our host, Coach Menachem Bernfeld to open up with some uh, opening words. Thank you very much, Rabbi Asher. So Baruch Hashem, Welcome everyone to share number 67. And uh, it's a big schos to have Rabbi Friedman with us. The truth is, is it really possible to live with total menuchas nefesh? Isn't that what we're all looking for? And I think tonight we're going to get some idea in Mitz Hashem. Now again, from idea to lemaisa, it might, you know, to actually apply it, might take a little bit of work, but to, to get it started in Mitz Hashem. So the truth is, anxiety and fear, there's a lot, there's, the spectrum is, is huge. You can talk about the regular, you know, Bafi Yeshiva has anxiety, social anxiety, you talk about Shidduchim, talk about after the Chasna, having kids, sending them to school, Bechlal, um, getting them into the right schools, how do I know, right decisions, and it goes on and on. Many people think that, you know, just by doing everything, just by uh, trying to do what's right, but I'll, I'll be able to avoid the anxiety, but they find themselves being anxious or worried, whatever it is. And it is very important to have these tools or whatever it is to be able to apply it. I remember a while ago when I was in Etzisrael, there was a guy who was there was somebody there that were doing virtual reality. He put on these glasses and I was watching somebody walking on a plank and they were shivering. But then I, I found out that in the glasses, it actually looks like you're on top of a building. So I decided I want to try it out. So he said, no problem, 10 shekel. So I give him 10 shekel, put on the glasses and basically you walk into a building you walk into the elevator, you press the button, and the elevator goes all the way, all the way up the building. When you're on top of the building, the door opens up, you're on top of the building, and you see the whole city. I remember how my, my heart felt. I, I, I was petrified. And then he says, okay, now start walking on this plank. There's a plank that's really laying on the floor. There's nowhere to fall. But in my mind, the picture from this camera is so clear it's on top of the building, walk on the plank. I couldn't walk on the plank. 
and I, and logically I was thinking to myself, I, I know there is nowhere to fall. It's on the floor right over here where I am. So why can't I just walk on it? And I was beating myself up. But basically what I realized was you can know something logically. Many times, you know, it's very clear. You're in a building. There's nothing there. There's just a piece of wood. You cannot fall. But the picture in my mind, what the glasses does, it makes it so clear that it looks real that I was, I was scared. So many times people have, logically they know Hashem runs the world, whatever he does is for good. And we know all the, what we need to say, but to actually live it, that can be a challenge. So it does take work and many times on just understanding, getting the concept could help. Some people can't do it by themselves, would need, do need some professional assistance. And sometimes medication is needed. But to get it started, hopefully tonight, the Mitzvah Shem will get to understand a little bit behind of what's going on. And before we start, Rabbi Friedman, I have to say that many times, last time when I asked questions, it sounds like I'm questioning what you're saying. But I just need to throw it out there. Just sometimes I ask just to clarify so that people could try to understand and apply it to their own life experience. So thank you very much, Arafim, for being with us tonight. And Amit Hashem, we shall see you the Shmaya. Beautiful opening words. Let's first start off with tonight. Tonight's sponsor is sponsored by Recovery at the Crossroads. Recovery at the Crossroads is the only kosher inpatient treatment center in the tri-state area. They are licensed co-occurring treatment facility, which means they are licensed to not only treat substance abuse, but other types of underlying mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, or trauma. They've been around 15 plus years and have helped many from families and put tremendous effort in working together with the family. If you or anyone you know is struggling with an addiction, please feel free to reach out to them at 888-466-5950. The number is 888-466-5950. I wanted to just mention Menachem, I know it's a little early to mention it, but it's official that Coach Menachem Bernfeld is actually middle putting season one book together. And it's in the works. It should be coming out in six to eight months. Um, we're writing a short synopsis of every share, pulling out what we got out of it, and going to put it into one big book. We, we we're in the middle of already season two. But much in season one, we're going to start working on it. If anybody, you know, again, this share is built with all the listeners, people coming on every week. If anybody wants to help or, you know, dedicate a, a share or a speech, please reach out to coachmanachem at gmail.com. If any more information, it's, it's going to be a tremendous book. We've helped a tremendous amount of people. And Hashem, um, this book is going to really take the share to the next level. I want to say tonight's share, and this is this is actually leading into what I'm saying now. Tonight's share, we're going to be learning Rabbi Manas. We're going to learn this in Schus, Le'el Anishmas, Yehuda ben Reb Shalom Chaim. Tonight, today I was by a Leviah of a Bachar who was 18 years old in Lakewood. And um, we actually, I knew him very well. He was a Talmud of a Rebbe of mine across the street. And I've seen him go through high school and really grow tremendously. And me and Menachem, when we started the shear, we, after a few shearim, we were doing it five, six times. He, um, I turned to Menachem, I said, no, we're having a good time, we're hacking, we're putting people on, therapists, we're putting concepts out there, but are we really helping people? Are we really doing anything? We're just hacking. And he came into us, we're sitting actually in the garage, Menachem, if you remember, during COVID, and this buffer came in and he said, you know, I listened to one of your past shearim, there was a therapist on, and he said something to me and I realized I need to work on this prop and I'm gonna go get the help for this specific thing. And he, it was it was just from that, but this Bachar alone, it was a tremendous chizik to see that people come here every Sunday and they, 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 they open up their minds, the concepts and the ideas and to get the help that they need, whether Baruch News, Bagash News, whatever it is, just to put the things out there. So uh, I, I was really, it was a heartbreaking Levaya, 18 year old Bachar, uh, really, he was supposed to go to Eretz Yisrael in two weeks. He was supposed to go learn Eretz Yisrael and um, for the father, for the mother, for the Gans Mishpacha, Schuss from all the hundreds and thousands of people that are going to listen to the shir and the Mashem the replay. Should be in Schuss of the Nisham, Yehuda Ben Shalom Chaim. Okay, and then I want to put another thing. I know Nachi's on tonight. Nachi from Meaningful Minute is on. And uh, we do, we are our friends, we do collaborate. And um, Baruch Shem, he just put out Rabbi Manis' Friedman's uh, interview. It's coming, it went out this over the weekend. And it's going to come on YouTube, I think, tomorrow. I listened to part of it. It was very deep. It was very uh, to know Rabbi Manis' history, where he comes from. So uh, definitely I would advise anybody to listen to it. I think it should be tremendous. Rabbi Manus, I'm going to read your bio and then you could open up if that's okay. Okay. I, I cut it very short because, you know, it would take about, a, you know, about an hour to read it. 
world-renowned author, counselor, lecturer, and philosopher, philosopher Ramanus Friedman combines ancient Torah wisdom with modern wit to captivate audiences around the world. He hosts his own critically acclaimed cable, cable television series, Torah Form, with Manus Friedman syndicated throughout North America and is known as YouTube's most popular rabbi. We have, we have a superstar here, YouTube superstar. In his private practice, Rabbi Friedman has helped thousands of couples and individuals achieve fulfilling, balanced relationships through his in-person meetings or remote video consultations. One second. Rabbi Friedman is a noted biblical scholar and recognized for his grasp of the Jewish myth mythicism. In 1971, he founded Beis Khan Institute of Jewish Studies in Minnesota, the world's first yeshiva exclusively for women, where he continues to serve as dean from, 18, 19, from 1984 to 1990. He served as a, as a simplest translator for the Lubavitcher Rebbe, tele televised talks. Rabbi Manus Friedman was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia in 1946. Rabbi Friedman Im immigrated with his family to the United States in 1950. He received his rabbinic order from the Rabbinical College of Canada in 1969, and he is professionally ranked member of the National Speaker Association. His speaking tours take him to every part of the country, as well as Israel, England, the Netherlands, South Africa, Australia, Brazil, Venezuela, Peru, China, and yes, I know you're all thinking about that, Hong Kong also. With the launch of it's good to know org, Rabbi Freeman is now using the latest technology to spread morality to wider audiences throughout the world through his books, videos, and personal meetings. He has made it his mission to reach every one of the billion people on YouTube in order to help them improve the relationships and deepen their connection with Hashem. As I said last time, I'm gonna say the same joke. Rabbi Freeman, just in case he didn't know it, Rabbi Freeman is Avram Fried's brother. His son is Benny Friedman. His nephews are Ellie Marcus and Eighth Day. And Rabbi Friedman, open it up with a good nigan. Harasho. Harasho. Okay, so um, we have to first recognize we're going to deal with an issue, a very real issue, a practical issue, a life threatening issue at times, but it's a little slice of life. And whatever solution we come up with, it has to fit with the rest of your life. In other words, you have to have a comprehensive, consistent view of life so that all the pieces work. But if each piece is separate and uh, is not in harmony with the other pieces, uh, we just create new problems in place of the old ones. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with this one issue tonight, but uh, you, know, you have to have like a shita, you have to have a lifestyle where all the parts work together. And that's, that's not easy. So let's first make sure that we're using our, our words intelligently. A word like anxiety is, is very vague. What exactly do we mean by anxiety? What is anxiety? You can say anxiety comes from the need to control. If I feel like I can't control the outcome or the future or, or the results of my efforts, I become anxious. I need to feel in control. There are people who have trust issues. In life, you have to trust. A child has to trust his parent, a teacher, a uh, student has to trust the teacher, uh, the soldier has to trust the general. It's, it's a necessary, indispensable part of life that you have to be able to trust. People have a problem. They can't trust. Well, if you can't trust, then you don't have the support system that everybody needs. That could be the problem. You could also be a perfectionist. Your expectations are unrealistic. And because the expectations are unrealistic, you're going to end up with, with anxieties. If your expectations were realistic, you end up with ambition. 
when they're not realistic, you end up with frustration and anxiety. Finally, what makes it really confusing is that on the one hand, we are told to be responsible. You have responsibilities. You're supposed to accomplish, you're supposed to achieve, you must. On the other hand, we don't run the world. There are things that are out of our control. So how do these two work together? I'm supposed to succeed, but there are forces that I can't control or I can't change that are getting in the way and work against my success. So you might say people who are totally calm, like have total menucha sanefesh, are irresponsible people. They're coasting through life. They really don't care one way or the other. So whatever happens, they're fine. Is that a good thing? But then you have the very responsible person, driven, always, trying so hard to do the right thing that he's making himself crazy, he's making his family crazy, the people around him crazy. Is that a good thing? So how do we balance the fact that we're not in control and yet we're responsible? How do you, how do you live with those two things? That produces a lot of anxiety. So we have right at the beginning of the davening every morning, there is this absolutely brilliant little paragraph in which we ask Hashem to protect us from these things because there's no way that we can protect ourselves from it. Just saying it every morning, laying it out, I am starting my day fully aware. I cannot protect myself from false accusations. I cannot protect myself from Lashon Hara, people will speak about me. I cannot protect myself for unforeseeable tragedies or, or illnesses. I can't protect myself from people bearing false witness against me. I can't protect myself from people suing me frivolously. And the rest of the list there. But it is such a healthy and grounding way to start the day. We know up front, there are things that I cannot protect myself against at all, ever. It's just out of my control. So I put it in God's hands. I say today, please, I can't. I'm trusting you, protect me from these things. And just saying it is psychologically so healthy, so realistic, that it makes it a lot easier to proceed with the unpredictable and uncontrollable future of the day. What is today going to bring? So here's where we have this, this conundrum. I have to start my day with ambition. I'm going to make this a great day. Today I'm going to work hard and I'm going to succeed and I'm going to be productive and I'm going to accomplish the things I set out to accomplish. And at the same time, I have no idea what today is going to bring. And I can't control it. So it seems like people have to choose one of two extremes. Either just give it up, live for the moment because you can't control it anyway. So just don't care, don't take it so seriously and uh, waste your life away. But at least you'll be calm. <laughs> calm and useless. Or you take your responsibilities very seriously because you must accomplish and you must produce and you must have something to show for yourself. And then uh, you're on popping pills on anti-anxiety and antidepressants, <laughs> all sorts of stuff just to keep you going. So what is the Dera Hamitsua? 
What is the wisdom that enables us to walk this path without going to the extremes and without being unrealistic? So the ultimate answer is bitachon. God runs the world and you have to let him. Bitachon means number one, you have to let God run the world because you really don't have a choice anyway. Number two, you have to know that if God runs the world, the world will end up in a very good place because he is he's very good at it. He knows how to run worlds. And number three, you have to trust and have betachem that it'll be not only good for the world, but that it'll be good for you. You have to believe this very deeply, but in order to do that, you have to understand what it is you're believing. What are you believing? That God will give you whatever you ask for? Is that what we're supposed to believe? So what exactly do we believe that gives us a sense of, of security, a sense of clarity, so that we can proceed responsibly without overwhelming our, our, uh, our fuses and ending up damaged and hurt and despondent all because we tried so hard to be good. So those are the issues. Let's understand which anxiety we're talking about. Is it a, a control issue? Is it a trust issue? Is it a expectation issue? Is it perfectionism? What, what exactly are we talking about? And they're not the same thing. So under the banner of anxiety, we have many different concerns that have different responses. And just clarifying the issue is already helpful and, and calming to know exactly what, it, what is it? Which anxiety am I experiencing? And as you say, some people just need medication. You know, LP, LP, uh, halacha. If you if you cut your nails, your fingernails, your toenails, and you don't wash neglavasa, you will suffer fears that are irrational and that you can't explain. And the same after you cut your hair. If you don't wash neglavasa, you will suffer from anxiety that is free floating without any particular cause. So yeah, there, there's, there's a condition called anxiety, which is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about medical conditions. We're talking about how a person should proceed in life with wisdom, with a little seichol, so that he's in charge of his feelings and not a victim of them. Hey, Rabbi Friedman, beautiful. Thank you for such a strong opening. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions. So we'll give you a minute to breathe. Um, let's take a poll first and let's see what the Ilm has to answer. We're going to ask everybody on the Zoom tonight to answer questions so we can get a feeling of where everybody's holding and get some concepts. And then we're going to go dive straight into questions, okay? How often do you think people experience anxiety? It's three, one of three choices, either multiple times a day, a few times a week, or rarely. Second question, do you think fears and anxiety can really be cured? Yes, I believe they can really be cured. Second option is partially, but not totally. And the third option is not really, can't really cure them. Answer those two questions. It's anonymous, we won't know who is. And if you're ner nervous that we will, that's probably paranoia, not anxiety. Okay, five, four, three, two, 
one. Okay. Let's share it. Okay, share with everybody. Okay, this is what you guys answered. How often do you think people experience anxiety? Rabbi Manus Friedman, 65% of people here feel that most people experience anxiety multiple times a day. So it's probably a hot topic that we chose. 32% feel a few times a week and only 4% feel rarely. Second question, do you think fears and anxieties can really be cured? 44% 44% of people said yes. The winning answer, 54% said partially, but not totally. And 3% of people said not really, that they really can be cured. So you can exit out of the screen if you want. Stop sharing. Okay, close it. Okay, let's get into some questions again. We have the discuss of having Rabbi Nas Freeman here tonight. If anybody is able to turn on your camera, be interactive. Let's do that. And um, we got a tremendous amount of emails. This is obviously a very, very uh, relevant topic to people. So please uh, text me, Osher Parnas, your questions. Live questions go first. Um, and then we're going to try to cover all the other questions. This is a huge topic. So let's start first. Um, I'll start with the first question, Robert Freeman. Okay. You ready? Yeah. You have anxiety or no? I am anxious to hear your question. Okay. I'm worried. I guess you could say I'm a very nervous and always, and always my, my mind always takes me to worst case scenarios. Is there something I could do to help myself get better? Or this is just who I am. I'm a nervous person. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, I have a friend who is always calm and happy, no matter what happens in their life. They've gone through terrible situations. Can you please help me understand my personality better? Um, I'm, I'm just going to be guessing now from a little bit of information, right? We're, we're, gener we're, we're, we're generalizing. It's a general... Yep. Yep. It has to be. So... All sorts of thoughts come to me that are anxious, anxiety producing, all sorts of negative possibilities and stuff that could go wrong. That sounds like a person who is convinced that they really need to be in control and every possibility that is out of their control threatens them. So that's why you keep noticing, oh, this is out of my control, and that's out of my control. And what if this happens? And what if that happens? Okay, we got the picture. You're not in control. You don't have to keep proving it by coming up with every possibility in which you will not have control. So the question is, how much control is reasonable? How much control can you expect? And how much is beyond human? Of course, we're in God's hands, whether we like it or not, whether we are comfortable about it or not, but we are in God's hands. We can't decide to be born. We can't decide to be healthy. We can't decide to be talented. We're in God's hands. we got to make peace with that fact. So coming up with a chidush every 10 minutes, Wow, there's another thing I can't control. <laughs> okay, stop making a collection of how many things you can't control. It's true, you can't control. Neither can anybody else. But that's the nature of life. So the question is, where should your mind go? So that's the second half of the question. His friend who always seems to be comfortable. What is his friend doing right that allows him to be comfortable like that? Here's, here's really the crux of the whole issue. The rest is really just commentary and details. The worst thing that a person can suffer from, because we are intelligent creatures, the worst thing that we can suffer from is aimlessness. I don't know where I'm going. I don't have a map. So I don't know where I'm supposed to end up. So I don't have a, a compass. I don't have a direction. I don't have a GPS. I don't know where I'm going. A guy is a Malamed. He wakes up every morning. He doesn't know whether he's supposed to be a Malamed. Well, what's that going to do to him? 
his entire day is one huge uncertainty. So every difficult student, every, every disappointment, every frustration just reminds him that maybe he shouldn't be a Malamed. That uncertainty, that aimlessness undermines everything. And then every possible insecurity, every possible anxiety is going to hit him. So the first thing is, what is your life about? What are you doing with your life? And how well are you doing it? Not whether you should be doing it. That's self-sabotage. If you have a job, do it well. Stop questioning whether this is the job you're meant to do. Don't undermine what you have. You're good at something? Then, then do it. Stick with it. Improve it. Perfect it. Do it better. Do it more. Do it, do it with more devotion, with more, with more kavana. But always questioning what should I be when I grow up? Well, you're all grown up. And you already are something. Yes, you can also be other things. But, but that's such a, that's such a self-sabotaging thought. I know there's a Mishnah. I don't know if we talked about this last. The Mishnah in, in right in the beginning of uh, Psachim. The night before Pesach, you have to search the rooms of the house to make sure that there's no chametz. You take a candle and you go from room to room and you search in all the cracks and crannies to see that whether there's chametz in the room. The Mishnah says, after you check a room and it's clean of chametz, you don't suspect that maybe when you turned your back after checking the room, a mouse dragged a piece of chametz into the room you've already searched. And therefore, you should go back and search again. So the Mishnah says, no. Ein cheshushin, we do not entertain that suspicion. Why? Because ein ledavar seif. There's no end to this. You'll check again. Now you're sure there's no chametz? Hey, you just turned your back. Go check again. And even if you can check the room in such a way that there is no chametz anywhere in the house to bring into the room, maybe the mouse brought it from the yard. And even if you check the yard and there was no chametz in the yard, maybe it came from the street. It just goes on and on. Maybe it just got off a boat from China. <laughs> so there's no end. And where there is no end, you do not suspect. Which means the word maybe can make you crazy. I'm a pretty good dentist, but maybe I should be a teacher. Maybe. How are you going to resolve that question? Yeah, maybe. No, so what do you want to do? You want to quit your job? and maybe become a teacher. And then when you're a teacher, you'll be, you'll be secure and satisfied, or then you'll think maybe you should become an accountant. Every maybe has to have a tachlis. If it doesn't have a tachlis, throw it out. Don't entertain it. Not only you don't go back and check the room again, you don't suspect, you don't carry, you don't harbor the suspicion that there is chametz in that room because ein ledov are safe. So this is the first thing. Decide what your life is about and just do it better instead of questioning what your life should be about. What your life should be about is a good question for a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old but not a 46-year-old.
so <clears throat> the first thing, put that, put this at the top of your list. The first thing is aimlessness. That is the worst thing that can happen to a human being. When you know what you're doing, you may not be the best dentist in the world. That's not paranoia. That's very realistic. You may not be, but you do your best and you're making a living and you're helping people. Do it better. Don't question whether you should be doing it. And the same with your Yiddishkeit. You know, should I be practicing this minhag, that minhag? Should I belong to this shul, to that shul? Should I? You're a Jew and you're serving God. You're doing mitzvahs. Just do it better. Okay, Rabbi Manis, we have a tremendous amount of live questions. I think we already struck up the conversation. So let's start. Let's see where tonight leads us. Okay, you're on. Hi, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you for being with us again. Uh, one of the tools I know that's taught in Chabad a lot, one of the concepts is that when one's going through a challenging situation, instead of having fear of the situation, one should track good, but sign good. They should think positive and things will go good. Uh, in my own personal experiences, whenever I go through a challenging situation and I try to think positive, two major setbacks come to my mind. One of it, one of them is that an inner voice kind of tells me that you're kind of being, by speaking positive, you're kind of being delusional and negligent because if, as if you're actually nervous every second, you'll keep on trying to search for an answer to, to resolve the situation. And the second, second thing is that if you keep on be worrying about the matter, if chas v'shalom, the worst thing happens, which could happen, at least there'll be like a cushion to minimize the pain because you were ready for it. But if you thought, if you keep on thinking everything will be good and something just happens that you, the worst happens, then it'll be like a shock to the head. It'll be a blow in the mind. So what would be a way to resolve these inner voices? That's, that, is, that is a very fundamental, a very fundamental question and issue. And we got to make this very, very clear. Lowering your expectations so that you won't be dis terribly devastated when things go bad will protect you a little bit from, from disastrous results. A little bit. But it will take all the enthusiasm out of life. It's not worth it. We have to be enthusiastic about life. We have to live life like it's the best thing we have in the world. Enthusiastic, optimistic, positive, that's life. When you tell children, and there is such a philosophy in psychology, you got to tell children about death. You got to tell, you know, you got to prepare them for the hard knocks in life so that when it happens, it shouldn't be so devastating. That's like saying every, marry, every couple who are about to get married, you should tell them that they're probably going to get divorced, so they shouldn't get their hopes up too much, so that when the divorce happens, they won't be devastated. You've made divorce less painful, but you made marriage less meaningful. You make the pain a little less, but the enthusiasm in life you've completely destroyed. It's not a good way to think. On the contrary, if you're very enthusiastic about life, yes, you will be devastated when life ends. And that's how it should be. There's a time to grieve, to really grieve, not a little grief because you were expecting the worst. That's not, that's not a good way to live. It's not a Jewish way to live. Because if we went that way, we would have been so discouraged, we would have quit a long time ago as a people. So, trach gut wird sein gut applies to those things where you are not responsible. In other words, things you can't control. It's not a cop out that you don't have to try and you don't have to fix things because you're optimistic. It'll all be good. 
it'll all be good only applies to the things that you put in God's hands, which is almost everything except Yerashamayim. Everything is in God's hands except your goodness, your, your, your holiness, your godliness. That's up to you. And there you don't say tracht gut wird sein gut. So it is not, it doesn't undermine your responsibility and it doesn't protect you from, from righteous pain, genuine grief. We, we should not protect ourselves from it and we shouldn't protect children from it. Grief is a bitter pill, but it's a part of life. One of the Rebetzins back, back in, in uh, the terrible times under communism, um, somebody said to her, it has been a bitter moment. It's been a bitter experience. And she said, bitter? Okay. Just don't say bad. Bad is depressing. Bitter? Medicine is bitter. So there are things in life that we should feel extremely pained by because, because we prefer life over death. So we have to reject and object to death with all our might. That's called grief. We don't accept it. We don't make peace with it. And we don't soften the blow. Why? Because we're really enthusiastic about life. So the power of thinking positive is only in those things where, where you cannot control the outcome other than with your expectation. It also helps you know where you want to go. A couple come to me, marriage counseling. My first question is, are you hoping that this session will lead to a divorce or to a reconciliation so that you can stay married to each other? And if you're trying to stay married to each other, tell me why. You just gave me a list of good reasons to divorce each other. Why do you want to stay together? Tell me where you're going. What are you thinking? Where is your heart? So in a time when you know health is kind of touch and go, and you don't know how it's going to end up, how do you want it to end up? Make that very clear in your own mind. That's thinking positive. Yes, any, anything can happen. But what I want to happen is all the positive good stuff. And that changes the reality. Jeremy Freeman, so many more questions. Let's try to cover more. Okay, you're on. Hi. Hi. Um, um, sorry. Okay. So, um, I just have a couple of things to say. I feel a lot of shame, especially when you said um, to the person that um, like you're in your, your like you told them they're 46 and like they should like, you know, know what they want in life. Um, so my situation is one where um, I had a very, very traumatic childhood and I'm living with um, severe anxiety and complex PTSD. And I tried medication and it's not the answer. I really tried like everything and all it does is dull me. And I'm not sure how to deal with it. I definitely like have trust issues. I live in fear. I'm single and I feel like Hashem has, Hashem hates me. And I've been like on disability most of my life. Um, I struggle with like mental health and even um, with this shit, like I hope I'm not scaring anyone by saying this because I'm, I am like, I'm okay. But like, just like even four weeks ago, like I attempted suicide and I woke up 35 hours later, very sick and I'm no longer suicidal, no issues because I don't want to hurt people. But um, I'm struggling a lot and I'm just trying to think of like, in terms of like, I guess how to narrow my question. Um, Maybe I just feel like, 
what's the point? I feel like Hashem hates me and just wants to punish me. And I have a lot of fear. <sighs> yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much for sharing, by the way. That was, that was very powerful. Uh, your name is not Rooster, is it? We're going to go with Rooster. You're going to go with Rooster? You don't want to give a name? Okay. Uh, tell me, why do you think God hates you? I know I'm by now like an adult and like I really should be able to form like logical um, thoughts, but um, like, like for like the first, like, you know, 18 years of my life, I was just being told, you know, you are such a bad person. You are going to get Henan. You're the cause of all the problems. And like a lot of bad things happened to me and I kept making deals with Hashem. Like, you know, like I'm going to be really, really good and like, you know, nothing will ha happen today. And I kind of like, I, I, I really cried really, really hard. And then somehow between the messages that I got and then all the things that, um, messages that I got from the adults in my life, as well as like, like even just as an adult, just trying to like better my life and trying to lead a better life and working so hard. Um, I feel like I've just constantly just failed. And so I feel at the end of the day, like I don't really feel like I have any accomplishments and I feel like Hashem just like has basically turned his back on me and he hates me and I'm going to Gehenna because that's what I was like, I know, I know it's so many years later, but I still can't break that mental, it doesn't matter how many times people say things to me, I can't change that belief. So let me, let me tell you something. You are much smarter than you give yourself credit. And you are surviving by, by your wits because you've worked out a system of thought that helps you survive. One of the reasons you're convinced that God hates you is because that explains a lot. All of these things happening, everything going bad, everything going sour, how do you explain this? And you need to explain it just to stay sane. One of the best explanations, really logical, is God hates me. What am I going to do? Fight with God? So if it's just a person who hates me, then I got to go work it out with them and maybe have a discussion, try to make peace. But if God hates me, well, then, you know, what do you want from me? You see, that helps you survive. It doesn't make you more miserable. It makes you stronger by thinking that God hates you. It's a brilliant plan. In other words, all the thoughts you have, which are painful, which are negative, they're all part of your brilliant survival mechanism. Give yourself a little credit. The question is, is it true that God hates you? And the answer is no, not at all. Is it true you're going to Gehenna? You're going to go to, no, you've already, you've already satisfied that, that experience. You've been there already. You've covered that. You've paid your dues. Now you're not going to Gehenna anymore. So, the, stra the strategy, it was a brilliant one, but it's not working anymore because you're ready to go on to a better plan. So on the one hand, give yourself credit for having come this far. Brilliantly, by the way, resourcefully. Now it's time for an even better plan, a better survival mechanism that is actually true. So tell God that you're not angry at him, and he's probably not angry at you. He certainly doesn't hate you, and he does not want you to suffer. 
That's all in the past. From today on, make peace with God. Ask God what you can do for him, how you can serve him. And whatever he offers you is fine. You don't need any more than that. It'll be such a relief and a very good survival mechanism. So try a new, try a new approach. The old one got you this far, but I think you're older and wiser and you're ready to move on to a better strategy. Does that make sense? Okay, she should mute it, but I hope I hope uh, I hope it works. She should probably go with to do it with somebody because by herself with all the thoughts from 46 years is hard to uh, rewire. Yes. yes, but what I'm saying is sometimes people ask a question and the question is their answer. And they don't want to give up an answer. So if God hating you explains your life, why would you want to give that up? So the question is not in, in your mind. The question is not, does God hate you or why does God hate you? No, God hates you. That's the answer. Nobody gives up an answer unless you come up with a better one. So this is our problem very often. We, we use bad news as an explanation and an answer. And then we get stuck with it. So it's not even a complaint anymore. It's good news. I understand my life. God hates me. Now I've got it all under control. Convince yourself that God doesn't hate you. Well, then all the old questions come back. Then why this? Why that? Why was my childhood so difficult? So you've given up on a good answer. Why would you want to do that? People say, I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to Gehenna. And that is a relief. I'm going to go to Gehenna. Okay, that's it. I can stop worrying about it. I've made peace with it. And now I can live knowing that I'm going to Gehenna. It's not, it's not a complaint anymore. It has become a comfort. But, but there are better, better ways of finding comfort. And as you get older, you, you move up from a, from a simple strategy to a more, a more profound strategy until your life is in harmony with what God wants which is perfect. Okay, now we're going to take it to more practical. We have a question from a bucher. How does one deal with anxiety and fear when it comes to regular daily life problems? From a bucher's point of view, like trying to learn and grow, but there's life challenges and you're anxious and have fear that you won't get what you want from Hashem or something bad might happen since I'm such a failure and keep doing wrong things. There's a lot in that question. I'm a failure, so I keep doing wrong things. I'm a failure is the explanation, not the question. You're, you're explaining, you're justifying your failures by saying, I'm a failure. That, that probably started with unrealistic expectations. You were determined to be the best and the smartest and the greatest, and you can't, you can't live up to your own expectations, so you decide you're a failure. And then if other people tell you you're a failure, it feels almost correct and right. It confirms your suspicion, and now you know, yes, you are a failure, so you might as well quit and give up. That's, that's a terrible...
Okay, we have so many live questions. Let's go. Wait, wait. I want to hear what, what he has to change. What should the Bacher think? He's still a Bacher and he's still in yeshiva. Tomorrow morning, wake up and say, today I'm going to really concentrate on learning. I'm not going to become a Talmud Chacham today. I'm not going to become a genius today. I'm not going to be the best Bacher in yeshiva today. But today I dedicate to learning. See how that feels. Dedicate yourself to the project, not to the outcome. Okay. Next question live, you're on. Hi, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about any recommendations on tangible, practical tools that one can use in the moment when somebody is feeling anxious or afraid for the future, um, feel like they're, they're working in getting in the direction of what we're talking about tonight, but you know, it's a process. So what, what in, in the moment can we, can we do to help ourselves? To help yourself, not, not somebody else. Yourself. Well, the first thing is you have to be humble enough to admit helplessness against the whole world. And again, this is a matter of, of uh, expectation. You become anxious when you hear things that are out of your control and we're so exposed these days. Every, every, every newspaper, every, uh, every site on, on the internet, you're exposed to things that are meant to be intimidating and overwhelming because that's what makes headlines. Like somebody once asked, what am I supposed to do about the, the uh, global warming problem and the pollution of the oceans and the uh, mercury in the sea and uh, the crime in, 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 in public life and politics, all the corruption that's going on. What am I supposed to do about that? You know what the answer is? Nothing. You have a family? What are you doing for your family? Protecting them from mercury? <laughs> you see what? The news makes us crazy because it sounds like we're supposed to fix these problems. You know, like the comedian says, it goes to the post office and there are pictures of these serial killers. <laughs> and they say, help us catch Help, help you know. You want me to help you catch a murderer? And by the way, you were taking his picture. Why'd you let him go? <laughs> you had him right there. Lock him up. Anyway, so let's let's focus on what we can do and therefore should do, rather than what we possibly could could contribute towards. No possible. Focus on what is absolutely in your control and is therefore your responsibility. And don't take responsibility for what is beyond you. For the sun burning out. You know, the guy heard a speech from a scientist. The scientist was saying that in two billion years, the sun is going to burn out and all life is going to end. So he goes over to the professor after the speech and he says, let me just get this clear. You said in two billion years, right? He says, yes. He said, oh, thank God, I thought you said two million. I was so, I was so worried. <laughs> and if it's two million, it's your problem? And if it's a thousand years from now, it's your problem? Okay, so focus on what is expected of you, not what you expect. That is much more realistic. And then when you do it, you feel good. And all those other possibilities just disappear. Okay, let's go to the next live question. You're on. Hi, Rabbi Friedman, thank you very much. Some excellent insights. My question is, 
is anxiety about the future, which is of course not in our hands, but is anxiety a lack of betochen? There is an anxiety that comes from lack of betochen, which is a trust problem. And here's the confusion. Am I responsible for what's going to happen to me tomorrow? Or is Hashem responsible? I'm confused. Because I'm told that if I do the right thing today, then I can guarantee good outcomes for tomorrow. So it's my problem, my responsibility. And I shouldn't leave it to Hashem. On the other hand, I'm told that you have to have a muna, you have to have betachan, you have to let God run the world. So when do I take responsibility and when do I give the responsibility to Hashem? And if I give it to Hashem, can I trust him? There's the trust issue. So there are some people who would much rather have Hashem take the responsibility. And then there are those who can't. They want to take responsibility because they feel more secure, ironically. If it's my responsibility, then I can handle it. But it's not your responsibility and you can't handle it. So you've got yourself locked into an impossible situation. So the wisdom of knowing, what is that famous quote? The wisdom to know the difference between what I can control and what I can't control. Friedman, you want to mention that story of the, the, the wood with the Friedrich Rebbe's brother? Uh, what, what a little bit of wisdom can do. The previous Rebbe's brother invested a lot, his life savings, in lumber. So he bought a forest to make lumber, but it burned down. The whole thing, his whole investment, everything was gone. His friends came to console him and to break the news to him. And they found him sitting and, and learning. So they didn't know exactly how to soften the blow. And finally, they told him. And he said, oh, yeah, I know. They said, you know? He says, yeah, somebody came an hour ago and told me. He says, so how come, how come you're not upset? He says, I was upset. I was upset, and, and now I'm, I'm done. They, one, of the, one of the guys there said, in an hour or a half hour, whatever it was. So the Rebbe's brother said to him, well, how come you're not upset? He says, about what? He says, about your child's health. Remember, he had a problem? He says, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> he said, oh, so... In 10 years, you got over it? You're slow. It took you 10 years. I did it in an hour. Why should I schlep it out, drag it over, over 10 years when I can get over it in an hour? In other words, anything that isn't going to be a problem 10 years from now, so why do you have to worry for 10 years? And if it's not going to be a problem a week from now, so why worry the whole week? In other words, the maturity of the thinking it's out of my control. There's nothing I can do about it. I am now left without money and uh, I can still learn. So I'm learning. Okay, here we go. You're on. Hi, okay, I just have a quick question, a more practical question. What if the anxiety is from a fear of a specific person who has threatened in the past that they are going to turn your life upside down and they keep succeeding in doing it. How do you give that up? How do you get rid of such an anxiety, such a fear? I, I wouldn't call that anxiety at all because it's realistic. It's a worry. It's a concern. And in some way, a responsibility. You, you know the problem. You've identified the problem. What responsible steps can you take to protect yourself from this person or to distance yourself from this person? That's realistic. It's responsible. You're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not describing an, a condition. You're describing a problem. 
some guy in California said, what can I do to get rid of my fear of earthquakes? The guy said, move to Manhattan. <laughs> While you live in California, the fear of earthquakes is a reality, not a paranoia. So if you don't like it, move to Manhattan. So if you're living next to a neighbor who's harassing you or a family member who's out to get you, this is a realistic issue. You got to deal with it. Find a, find a way to protect I mean, yourself. Friedman, I want to put a connection on her question a little bit because somebody asked a similar question, but it's another twist to it, if that's okay, okay? I know that my, tr I know that my trigger is someone in my life that I cannot cut out. How could I deal with this person in the best possible way so I could have less fear and anxiety and not let them have free rent in my head? Ah. It sounds like the threat of this person is not a serious one, just an annoying one. If it's a serious threat, you call the police or, or you, you, you get some people involved, the community, somebody, a support system. But it sounds like it's just an annoying, um, disturbing influence in your life. And you're giving it a lot of power over yourself. And you yourself realize that you needn't do that. You don't want this presence occupying your mind day and night. So now it's a question of what you can do within yourself to strengthen yourself so that you're not derailed by this annoyance or this uh, interference in your life. And that, that is the right answer. The right answer is you want this thought in your head all day long? Don't, don't, don't harbor it. Here, here's a, an important principle. Tainuk tmidi ene tainuk. A constant pleasure stops being pleasurable. The same is true also with a constant worry. A constant worry is no longer worrisome. Because I've worried about this for years and I'm still worried about the same thing. So nothing happened. You can't get shocked every time an annoying person annoys you. You know already, this person is annoying. Don't be surprised next time he annoys you. So get comfortable with the fact, don't overreact to it every single time as if you didn't expect it. <laughs> this comedian says, my kids misbehave and I spank them and they have the chutzpah to look surprised. <laughs> It's the same thing every day. Why are you surprised? <laughs> what? You're going you're gonna to spank me? Yeah, just like every day, because you do the same thing and you get the same results. I'm not advocating spanking. I'm just repeating a comedy routine. So don't overreact to how annoying this person who's been annoying all these years is still annoying. Don't give it so much, so much significance. Hey, somebody just sent in this email. I want to read it because they're listening now. I have a nine-year-old son with anxiety, hypochondriac, and mini panic attacks once in a while. There doesn't seem to have any, there doesn't seem to be any deep-rooted issues or trauma or anything. I've asked advice from two different professionals and I've been using their techniques for the last two years and has been, he's been showing signs of improvement. He has a flare ups and we work through it. Many believe that the following, that this is a chronic and we build his resistance as a struggle, he embraces and will be control of it. Do you agree with this approach? If, if I had to suggest something, I would suggest a homeopathic remedy. With children, those remedies are absolutely magical. And it's not torture where you have to go into your past life or your childhood or your subconscious uh, repressed fears. It's a simple remedy. It's safe, it's harmless, and it's very effective. 
give it a try. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have we have a lot more live questions. Okay, you're on. Um, Rabbi Friedman, thank you so much for taking my call here. Um, I have a birthday tonight. It's I'm 64, and I've <laughs> I've been divorced for uh, going on five years. Um, I guess as each birthday um, proceeds, and I'm not married, remarried yet, I'm getting very anxious and fearful that I will never get remarried. And I mean, I'm doing my histad loose, but I am getting kind of anxiety ridden about it. And um, my greatest fear is that I'm never going to find my soulmate. Um, and I really, I'm, I'm very emotionally um, anxious about that. And I just fear that I'm never going to find anybody. And, be, you know. Be careful. be careful that you're not doing what we spoke about before. You're not trying to prepare yourself for the worst case scenario by convincing yourself you're not going to get married so that you won't be devastated when it comes true. Don't do that. Because the truth is, every marriage is basheret. So you're going to get married if it's meant to be, even if you don't think it's going to happen. What if it's so, not meant to be? That's my, that's my anxiety. What if it's not meant to be? What if Hashem does not want me to find my soulmate in this, in this world? I mean, I don't, have to, I don't want to have to wait till the next world to, to meet my soulmate. I want to meet my soulmate now in body and soul. So I'm getting very anxious about that, that maybe that, that is not the, what Hashem's plan is, that perhaps that is not Hashem's plan. Perhaps. And how do I, how do I come to peace with that? How do I come to peace with that? That might be a reality. It might be. Yeah, it might be. It's a maybe. But if you're going to go with maybes, ask yourself, does God want people to be married or God wants people not to be married? Who invented marriage? <laughs> who, who stays up all night making shaduchim? If you had to guess, there's no question. Hashem wants people married. Why, why would you assume that, he, that you're the exception and you, he doesn't want to be married? Hmm. He wants you married more than you want to be married. So know this for sure. Even if you don't think you're going to get married, you will. Because that's the way God runs the world. Marriage is a good thing. God wants good things for his people. I'll, I'll send you a wedding invitation, Rabbi. Please do. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me give you a very powerful model of, of how to think. Mm -hmm. Imagine you have a thousand pieces of paper. On 999 pieces of paper, it says yes. On one, it says no. Mix all these pieces of paper into a hat and pick out one of them randomly. You pick out one piece of paper, you open it up, and it's the no. Wow, what are the chances? Put it back, mix them up again, and again pick out at random a piece of one piece of paper. <laughs> it's the no. How strange. You do it 10 times in a row, and 10 times the no comes up. Okay. Now do it an 11th time. What are you expecting? A yes or a no? Do you imagine? Definitely a no. A, definitely a no, of course. Definitely. <laughs> there are 999 yeses and only one no, and you're expecting the no? What happened? Past experience. Uh huh. Past experience can make you irrational. Uh -huh. You should not expect a no. 
it's already so surprising that it came up 10 times. <laughs> Why would you think it would come up an 11th time? That's ridiculous. It came up a hundred times in a row. And now you're gonna pick for the hundred and first time. You think the no is gonna come up again? Why? It's not rational. But your bad experience has soured your judgment. And now you think that out of a thousand pieces of paper, you're gonna get the one that says no. That's what nature does to us. It dampens our, 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 our reason. Everything in God's world is for the good. He's a creator, not a destroyer. And yet we've had so many painful experiences that we're starting to predict things that are completely irrational. It's going to go bad. It's not going to work. It's going to be, what are you talking about? Whose world is this? So don't, don't let bad experiences make you irrational. And that, that's, the, that's the real killer. <laughs> People say, be realistic. It's going to be the no again. <laughs> be realistic. No, if you're realistic, it's not going to be the no. Hey, Reverend Friedman, there's so many more live. The other ones want you. They want more of you. Okay, you're on. Hi. Can you hear me? Manashi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. Shalom Aleichem, how are you? Baruch Hashem, Kavadarav. It's good to see you again, like always. Uh, the, the question is, Shlomo HaMelech says, En chadash Hashem, there's nothing new under the sun. Could this also apply to the, the subject of anxiety? Like, is there really anything, any kind of anxiety that is not already discussed in Tanakh that our forefathers and our Naveen did not experience? There, there, there's hardly any mention of anxiety because we're dealing with really big people with big minds and big hearts and huge uh, roles in, in, in their communities. And we hear a lot about fear. Yaakov was afraid of Esav. It was not anxiety. Esav was more violent. Esav had more men. Esav was out to get him. It was a realistic fear. It wasn't anxiety. There may be in Tehillim, you might find where David HaMelech says, sounds like he's saying, I have anxiety. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm uncertain. I'm confused. But we got to understand what that means. David HaMelech was confused about what? <laughs> so fear is, is, is common and it's existed forever. But anxiety, I think, is more of a modern development, probably primarily because we're aimless. We don't see clearly what we're supposed to be. And that leaves us uncertain, not, not, not afraid, just uncertain. So whichever way we go, we're not sure it's the right way. So it's like, we're helpless. Whatever I do, it's not gonna be good because I'm not sure that that's what I should be doing. And that's why Chassidim would come to the Rebbe, what should I be doing? What is my mission and my shlichus in life? You know, if, a, if you have a Rebbe who can tell you, that's a huge blessing. Other than that, you have to take a hint from Hashgacha, where God is leading you, what God is showing you, the talent that God has given you and the success that God has given you. Take that as an instruction. That's where you need to be. That's what you need to perfect. That's where you need to put your energy and your efforts and your talents. And if you're supposed to be someplace else, God will let you know. 
Hey, Rabbi Friedman, let's jump on this question. It's a different twist on the whole angle. My husband really struggles with anxiety. I have two questions about it. A, how do I keep myself from getting annoyed and upset when he starts panicking about something? That's A. And B, how do I help him get through it and calm down? So again, the first thing is, what is this anxiety that he's suffering from? Financial disaster? Family rejection? Approval? What is it? Identify it. Otherwise, it's like a ghost that haunts you. And you're never sure where it is and where it's hiding and where it's going to show up. Identify it. Don't just call it anxiety or panic attacks. That's too vague. So let's identify it. Let's say it's financial. The husband hasn't had a job. He can't pay the mortgage. He's panicking. Once, once you've identified it, you've kind of corralled it. You've put a limit on it or you've gotten a handle on it. Now it's a realistic question. What do I do to uh, pay my bills? Sit down with two friends and work out a plan. Who says you have to solve the problem yourself? So once you know what it is you're trying to accomplish, use a realistic approach that will help you accomplish it. But just to sit in fear, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Self-inflicted. Freeman, I have a, a, se a separate question over here. If somebody, we believe in Ashkoch and Hashem runs the world, right? And everything, wherever it's going to be is Bashar. But if a person, there is a concept of a person, like she said before, she maybe she won't get remarried, she's projecting the negativity or going with that mindset because things are not working out. It's like a, it's like a clock. The more you things happen bad, the more you think bad, the more... Da -da. But at the end of the day, there is some reality to when you start thinking negative, things do happen negative. So what happens to the Hashem running the world anyway? So no matter, even if you think everything would be negative, it should be good anyway. So how does that, how does that balance? Yeah, the negative thinking um, kind of uh, delays or just complicates what is supposed to happen. But what is supposed to happen will happen. So no matter how negative you are, if you're meant to be successful, you will be. Only it'll be painful, it'll be confusing. The road to success will be very... Um, very un un unpleasant. Whereas if you are cooperating with God's plan, he wants you to be successful and you're expecting to be successful, then then the journey is much more is much more enjoyable. But what is supposed to happen will happen. And that takes a lot of the burden off people. The Rebbe once said to somebody who wanted their daughter's, he wanted his daughter's marriage to be sooner than the Rebbe had instructed because he had a heart condition, the father, and he was afraid that he's not going to be by his daughter's wedding. The Rebbe said to him, don't worry, it'll be okay. He said, but Rebbe, I am going to worry. The Rebbe said, there is nothing to worry about. You'll be okay. So he said, Rebbe, you know me. I worry. I'm going to worry. So the Rebbe made with his hand, and he said, worry, don't worry. Either way, it's going to be okay. So even when you do worry, you're not going to mess up God's plan. You're just going to make it harder on yourself until the plan happens. Okay, you're on. Next live question. Shalom, shalom, Harav. Thanks so much to Coach Menachem, Reb Usher, for facilitating. Um, I have a question with respect to anxiety from not only a genetic perspective, but developmentally and also situationally. We, it sounds like we're saying that, that radical 
Amuna, I'll say radical Amuna, in addition to other uh, wellness components, can can solve anxiety. Um, does that apply across the board, or are there some cases where those three factors can be so strong that long term a person will need to take more drastic factors such as medication, et cetera? Of course, there are there are circumstances where you have to have medication, you have to have therapy. But if you don't have a foundation of trust, if you don't have someone you can rely on, uh, kind of at the bottom of your of your structure, then all the all the therapy in the world is only going to put a band-aid on the problem. So even when you do need medication and even when you need heavy therapy, you still have to have a foundation. And then the therapy is much more effective and the medicine doesn't have to be so drastic because you've got a, 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 healthy, a healthy foundation to build on. So let, let, me, let me add this. this uh, what does it mean to trust God? Trust sounds so risky, doesn't it? I put my trust in something means I'm risking everything. So trust almost, it almost defeats itself. Trust me. You know, when somebody says that, <laughs> that's when you stop trusting him. Oh, trust me. No, I don't want to trust you. I want to be sure. Trusting you at best is a gamble. Maybe a safe gamble. What does it mean we trust God? Not we hope for the best. That is not secure. That's not trust. That's worry. Trusting in God means like this. God created the world. You know that? Yes. God runs the world. You know that? Yes. God has a plan by which he runs the world, a purpose for which he created it? Yes. This purpose is a good purpose? Of course. Can God change his mind? No. Can God lose interest in his purpose for which he created the world? No. That's what you base your trust on. It's not you hope he'll be good, you hope he'll be nice, or you hope God doesn't hate you. It's not a hope. If you know what God is, if you know that he is a creator, if you know that he is not human and fickle, that he's going to change his mind or lose interest or forget his project, none of that is even possible. So it's not that you trust because you're taking a, a, a gamble. Trust is absolute. God is the creator. That's absolute. He has a purpose. That's absolute. He will not change that purpose. That's absolute. So you can rely on God. You know, rely a better word than trust. <laughs> you can rely on him because there's no way that he can go bad. That's trust. It's 100% because it can't be any other way. Marriage used to be like this. When a man and a woman got married in Jewish life, there was no question. You're going to be loyal to each other? You're going to be good to each other? What was the question? Marriage was so serious. Marriage was so holy that if you get married, all doubts are gone. Today, we don't have that holiness, that that sanctity to the marriage. So we have to trust each other. And that's a little, you know, unsettling. You can't trust the marriage. You have to trust each other. Well, that's a little harder. Wow. 
Profound. You're on next. Yeah, you, Professor. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I just want to say a little bit of uh, my, to describe myself, there was a joke that went around like, I'm so used to being anxious that when I'm calm, I get nervous. So if you're see some people where anxiety almost becomes like a, you know, it's just it's quite, you know, part of our, you know, our DNA. But, um, you know, over the years, I've, you know, tried to develop this trust, as you're saying, but is there something, but I'm thinking of something that they take certain prophylactic measures, like insurance, or putting money away in a pension, or and I know in some communities that conduct production, I pronounce it correctly, in, in case of divorce. I mean, does that imply a lack of trust or am I, you know, I, you know, it's one thing, that, you know, my motto had always been that, you know, hope and pray for the best, although you say have trust, but there is still this idea of preparing for the worst, anticipating with that, you know, is that, would that, is that, uh, would that be wrong? I mean, maybe it's a healthy kind of anxiety. I mean, because if you, you know, if you have, you know, it's cheerful denial, you know, the other, the other hand. So yeah. I don't know what's the balance, really. Uh, you have a sense of humor. Well, thank you. <laughs> and you can, and you can joke about the anxiety. Yeah. So you're, you're way ahead of the game. Oh, thank you. <laughs> because with a little bit of humor, you can solve some of the most annoying problems. Yes. Right? You also remind me of another joke where yeah. saying, Jews are so guilt ridden. Yeah. We're so good at feeling guilty that if a Jew doesn't feel guilty, he just blames himself. <laughs> yeah, it's probably my fault that I'm not feeling guilty. No. So don't, don't ever lose that sense of humor. Okay. But a person who is truly anxious, like chronically anxious, he can have the best life insurance policy, the best health insurance policy, you know, live right next to a police station and a fire station, and he's still anxious. Realistically, you have to have insurance, not out of paranoia, but because there are things that will definitely happen and you have to be prepared for it. It's not, it's not an insecurity. It's a, it's a definite. People don't live forever. So you have to have life insurance. That's not being paranoid. That's being realistic. So you get a life insurance policy, you have a health insurance policy, and you have the number for Hatzalah, you know, should you need it? All that is just simply responsible. Now you can relax and enjoy life. You have your safety net in place. Now you can stop worrying about it. Even if she bought like, you know, uh, earthquake insurance in, the, in you know, Minnesota, yeah. that might be a little bit too much, right? Yeah, it's having, well, it's having a framework, I guess, if you, consider, you know, if you don't have a foundation. Of In Minnesota, you have to have uh, collapsing bridges insurance <laughs> in case a bridge collapses. That's true. So, okay. Let's go. We have, we have two more live questions. Rabbi Friedman, I have one more question. We have like three more. Let's try to get to it, and then we're going to go to closing, if that's okay, okay? Mm. Okay, you're on. Uh, Shalom Aleichem, Rabbi Friedman. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how will tshuva, by doing tshuva, how is that going to help me with self-confidence to uh, to make myself better, to improve, and to worry less, and to uh, to put my trust in Hashem? Now, now we're talking about one of the most common forms of anxiety, and that is anxiety of conscience guilt. Anxiety of conscience is a little more descriptive, but basically it's guilt. How do I get rid of the feeling of guilt? What, whatever, whatever consequences that is supposed to bring. Are you worried about suffering in, in, in the afterlife, about going to Gehenna? Are you worried that you don't deserve what you have? 
God forbid, you could lose it all because you don't deserve it. Are you worried about your reputation? What is this anxiety of conscience? So there's a very real, a very real fact of life that psychologists don't really specialize in. And that is anxious about your relationship with God. Even if you don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. There is an anxiety of conscience, even in people who don't believe in God, they're not religious, but everybody has a conscience. And if you don't know how to handle it, you suffer from an anxiety of conscience. And then you kind of, uh, you substitute your lucky stars for God. You know, are you going to have lucky stars? Are you going to have good luck? Are you going to have bad luck? What are you talking about? You're talking about God. But you don't want to call it that. So you call it stars or luck or whatever. But that would qualify as anxiety of conscience. Anxiety of conscience can be misunderstood, misinterpreted as a form of humility. I'm humble enough to admit that I made mistakes and I'm not all good. I'm guilty of many things. Isn't that humble? And now I'm worried that I'm going to get punished and God is going to take away whatever I have or give me stuff I don't want. Isn't that humble? No, it's not. It's a, it's a, um, a backward form of, 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 of ego, of arrogance. To think that God is busy all day long trying to figure out how to make you miserable. <laughs> not only isn't it true, it's not even nice to suggest that God has nothing better to do than to plot against you all day long, figure out new and different ways of making you miserable. No. If you really are thinking about God, trust him in what he says about himself. He overlooks sin. He forgives all the time. He asks you to forgive him for the difficulties he put you through. What, what is with this, with this angry, punishing God? Who invented such a thing? This is not the God of Israel. In fact, we're reading now what Moshe in Devarim, Moshe Rabbeinu is summing up what has happened in these 40 years. One of the things he says to them is, Atim Atem Nitzavim Hayeim Kulchem you are standing here solidly, all of you who have sinned. Moshe Rabbeinu was saying, you know, I told you about all the punishments that are going to happen when you sin, and you got really anxious and worried. Look, look, you sinned, and you're here, you're alive, you're standing firmly. Of course, every sin has its punishment. But no sin exists in isolation. For every sin, you also did a mitzvah. So how is God going to treat you? Just based on that one sin? No, not at all. Overall, the judgment in God's eyes is always positive. You may have sinned, you may have done things bad, but that's because you didn't get a good education, you didn't have anybody to inspire you, you weren't there at Har Sinai, you never saw a, a, a Beis Hamikdash. Not your fault. Even what is your fault is not your fault. So think the way God thinks. Why are you a more, a more critical and harsher judge than he is? So you want to do tshuva? 
by all means, do tshuva so that it'll get you closer to Hashem, not get you off the hook from punishment or suffering. That's not kosher. Okay, another live question. You're on. It's me? Yep. Okay. Hi, Rabbi. Um, I suffer from anxiety almost on a daily basis. I'm also fearful, a perfectionist, and a worrier, and have a slight OCD. Any tips to deal with this on a daily basis? Humor. If you can make a joke about your OCD, if you can laugh about it, if you can tell your friends how funny it is, how extreme it is, how unnecessary it is, you will cure yourself. If you're afraid to laugh at it, then it's getting out of control. It is stronger than you. It doesn't have to be stronger than you. You are the human being who happens to have an OCD habit. You're bigger than it, you're stronger than it, you're more important than it. So if you can laugh about it, you can, you can soften it for sure. You can make it more reasonable, more tolerable, and maybe even get rid of it. But it feeds into everything else. Of course. So it's just when one big mess. <laughs> yes. When you let it, when you give it that kind of control, it'll take over everything. Like a monster, a cookie monster. <laughs> Okay, two more last questions. There's one I tell the last caller. There's a, there's a song on YouTube called the OCD song. She should watch that song. It's going to cure all her problems. <laughs> Funniest song ever. And it talks about OCD. It makes it into a comedy. It's my OCD. But it, it's it, like a pizza pie, like one slice is a little crooked, you know, the shirt's crooked and everybody laughs about it. But okay. it, takes, it takes a little courage when you have OCD. It takes a little courage to be able to make fun of it. Because it sounds like you're making fun of yourself. But. Reverend Freeman, I got a few texts during the share. I'm just, it's a mask a general question because a lot of people just want to touch on it and whatever you could, you know. I'm getting quite a few texts tonight about social anxieties. A lot of people feel uh, uncomfortable. What do I do about social anxiety at parties, talking to people you never met before? I got, you know, going on dates. People, today's generation, it's very common social anxiety maybe because we're so internet based and so texting based. Any advice for people that are going through severe social anxiety? Uh, stop calling it anxiety. You're bashful. You're a little timid. You're not a social butterfly. And that's who you are. And there's nothing to apologize for. So you're going to go to an event. You're not going to be the center of attention because you don't want to be. And there's nothing wrong with that. So stop making an issue out of it and don't call it anxiety and don't call it a, a condition. Don't give it a title. You are who you are. You're a more private person. You're a more bashful person, which is a nice feature. It's an edelkeit. Don't, don't, don't condemn yourself unnecessarily. What happens when it limits you? You can't do things that you want to do. It limits you the same way that loud people are limited. <laughs> they can't go certain places because they're too loud and nobody will put up with them. So every, every personality type has its limits. It's okay. You don't want to exchange it for somebody else's limits. Okay. Go to, to the next question. Our issue is a common one, but everyone in it has their own unique perspective and challenge. We're currently waiting for children for over seven years. Our tefillah's efforts and constant amun and reminders get frequently exercised. There are times where we are calm, knowing we tried ours and Hashem is with us. He will perform a miracle and he only wants us to try and rely on him. But when efforts fail and we can't stop, we, we need to do ours and search for more ways of Ashtadlis. That's when fear sets in. As to hoping we will still marry children as Hashem, please, some insight to keep strong. I'm sure you won't be terribly surprised if I strongly recommend that you go to the Rebbe, the Labavitcher Rebbe's resting place and write a little note 
asking for healthy gesunte Kinder in plural. And then you can go home absolutely confident that you are going to have children because almost everybody who has ever asked the Rebbe for that blessing has gotten it. Other things also? Could we go with other tefillas? People should go for every problem. People go with every problem and every issue, but when it comes to children, the Rebbe was... You can take it to the bank. Maybe because the Rebbe didn't have his own? I don't know. But when he gave a bracha for children, you could take it to the bank. Okay, the final live question for tonight, and then we'll go to closing, Rabbi Friedman. Okay, I'm sorry. Here we go. You're on. Hi, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you. It's really wonderful. I must thank you for this. Um, my question is, what should be our reaction and feeling to pain, to sorrow, to bad news? On the one hand, like we hear and read, like especially if you read like Sperm of Breslov and uh, kind of, uh, like it's from like Begana Amuna, very famous saver. Like his, uh, what he like um, suggests is like ingrain in yourself the idea that Hashem is good and does only good and wants the best for you. And if so, like whenever something happens, even if it's like really bad and feels really painful, but just thank him and just thank him some more and thank him again. Um, on the other hand, like I think if you read just like to put it simple, like if you read like in Tehillim, like it always amazes me this passage. Like you read in Kapitel Peites, like David Amelach says, he starts off Chazde Hashem Olam Moshira. Like, and he speaks, he says that I know the kindness of Hashem in such a way that I'll forever sing it. And if you, like, continue, like, the end of the capital, like, he speaks about everything that Hashem, like, promised him and didn't end up uh, uh, doing so. Like, it seems, like, pretty intense. And, like, he finishes up, like, in a way, he, like, it, it seems like he's even, like, challenging, like, the whole meaning of life. Like he says, Alma And but he still like if you see like the start and the end is Hashem and Hashem So my question is like, is it good to like express and feel the pain and the sorrow when something is going wrong and bad in your life? Or should you just be like on a level that, or at, at least strive to be on a level that you just say and feel that everything is good? To actually feel that everything is good is a very high madrige, and not everyone can do this. Very few people can do this. What is realistic for most people is knowing that it's coming from Hashem is enough. I don't need an explanation. Just knowing that it's coming from him makes it acceptable. Baditcheva had a little nigun that he composed called Adudale, which in English means a song about you, do, or D. Mizrach do, Mairiv do, Tsofen do, right? Uh, up is you, down is you, east is you, west is you. It's all you. It's you, you, you. When things are good, that's you. When things are not so good, that's also you. And as long as it's you, it's good. It's a relationship. It's a devotion, not an ATM. Eberstedt is not a machine where you press a button and you get goods. It's a relationship. A relationship in which he hurts over you and you hurt over him. He loves you, you love him. It's a relationship. Sometimes there's pain in a relationship. 
Sometimes it's, why do you do this to me? That doesn't mean the relationship is over. It's part of the fabric. We don't know why. And we don't really need to know why. We just have to be able to continue the relationship. So if I trust you, that even when you do things I don't understand, I trust that you're not giving up on me, you're not quitting the relationship, you're not bailing out on me, the relationship goes on, well, then it's fine. So that's what David HaMelech says. I don't understand what's going on. Why do righteous people suffer? Why is there so much evil in the world? And why do, why do the wicked prosper? Oh, over and over again and throughout Tehillim. But the conclusion is always, we are in this together forever. And that's the comforting thought. So the final idea is we have a misunderstanding, terrible misunderstanding. We're told that God is perfect. And we assume that perfect means he never is hurt, he never cries, he never gets upset, because why should he, why should he care? Why should anything affect him, hurt him, bother him, or make him happy by the same token? So we have a picture of God as a perfect God who sits in heaven without any needs, without any concerns, without any commitments. But he's constantly judging us. Whoop, you did something wrong. Well, that's bad. For this, you get punished. Now you're going to have to suffer. It is such a horrible picture. And Achil Hashem, why would you give God such a bad reputation? It's not that way at all. For every pain we feel, God feels it infinitely. For every disappointment we suffer from, he suffers infinitely. This is not a one-way relationship. In this week's parsha, last week's parsha, God says, "Venosati uh, matar artsechem." Rashi says, "Now that you did what was on you incumbent on you to do, now I will do what is incumbent on me to do. I will give you the rain and success and so on." So it's so clear the Ebrister is not sitting there doing his own thing. He responds to what we do. We do our share. He does his share. It's a real relationship. And you know that when you're in a real relationship with somebody who is precious to you, the pains, the aches, they're, they're, all, they're all acceptable, doable, livable, like Tsar Gidl Bonin. You cannot raise children without some pain. Does that discourage you from having children and from raising them? Not at all. It adds another flavor to the mix. You know, with a lot of tears, mother's tears, and a lot of work and a lot of tehillim, we will eventually have a wonderful nachas from our children. I'm afraid I'm sorry. There's one more question somebody wants to ask, and then we're going to go to close, and we'll close a, a, a vort at the end. Okay, you're on. The last question of the night. Squeeze you in. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Rabbi Friedman, you just touched on my question. Um, when you said about Targi Dobanim. You know, I have a son that's off the derech, and I've made peace with the situation. I know this is a journey Hashem wants me to take. This is an Hashem Hashem gave me that I have to raise, and I'm at peace with it for myself. How do I get rid of that knot in my stomach when it comes to my child, when I'm watching him destroy himself, sometimes Gashmias and primarily Ruchnias? You know, there are three partners in the birth of a child. Why do we ignore Hashem's partnership? It's almost, we are responsible for this child, 
and God is going to judge us on how well we did as parents. No, that is not a correct picture. God is the third parent. And his responsibility and his com commitment to a Jewish child is much greater than yours. He's not a silent partner. So if you can't trust yourself to get your son back on track, can you trust him? He's capable. He wants your son on track much more than you do because it's his track, not yours. Yiddishkeit is not your track. It's not a house rule. It's the Ebishter's rule. So the Ebishter wants him more than you do. The Ebishter is concerned, more responsible than you are. Sometimes you have to let the third partner take over. So you do what you can, but the responsibility is now on on, on the Ibishta. You remain a good mother, a mother who has nothing critical to say about her child. Yira Shamayim, your son is missing and lacking Yira Shamayim. Isn't that between him and Hashem? So why should you love him any less? Why should you be any less his mother? Why should you enjoy his company any less? Of course you want his relationship with Hashem to be a good one too. You want his relationship with his father to be a good one. But your relationship shouldn't be dampened in any way. One third of, of his life healthy makes a huge difference. You're one third. Make your third good. Debrister will take care of his needs. So it's not you made peace with it. You're not giving up on your kid. You're not saying that he's never going to become a Yerushalayim. He's never going to fulfill his neshama's shlichus in this world with the mitzvahs that he's supposed to do. You're not giving up on that. You're giving up on the responsibility that you thought you had to make sure that he's a Yerushalayim. Wow. Shkoyach, Rabbi Friedman, sort of closing. First, I want to give a gracious credit to Rabbi Friedman for spending a solid two hours. I'm sure you knocked that after the Elm was so into it. It was tremendous chizik tonight. We went through so many questions. It was a chazik, a tremendous amount of people. And it was tremendous inspiration. And I think we, uh, we feel a drop better tonight. A little less anxiety after tonight's speech. If we do it every night, I think we'll be cured. Every night, same time, same place. Again, for anybody watching the share the first time, we do every Sunday night on the Zoom ID at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, share and the next week is going to be an amazing share. Again, tonight's sponsor is Recovery at the Crossroads. Recovery at the Crossroads is the only kosher inpatient treatment center in the tri state area that are licensed co occurring treatment facility, which means they are licensed to not only treat substance abuse, but also all other underlying mental health conditions, such as anxiety, depression, or trauma. If you or anyone you know is struggling with an addiction, feel free to reach out to them at 888-466-5950. Again, tonight's share, all the mentioned, there was uh, at least like 1,500 people that logged in tonight, if not more, and the thousands of people that will watch it later. should be a schus for this boy who was nifted today. I know him well. His name is Yehuda ben Rav Shalom Chaim. He's a Shabbat Shabbat Aliyah and the Bihamed Sesher for him and his family. Next Sunday's share, August 8th, we'll be having the amazing world-famous Dr. David Lieberman, We'll be discussing how to deal with difficult people and personalities, tactics and tools, how to apply them in real life scenarios. It should be a really interesting program, and I'm sure most people could relate to it. And again, anybody who mentioned at the beginning of the year, Menachem is starting to officially write the book of the first year of Coach Menachem. Rabbanis Freeman, you're in it. We rewrote the whole thing, everything you said. We changed all the titles and all the questions. So I'm sure you'll be happy with it. <laughs> Joking. We'll send you, we'll send you the, the pre thing once it's done. I and um, we're trying to write all the shir, just like a little bit shorter, just a little synopsis of what, what was spoken about. Should be a tremendous if anyone wants to be involved or help in any way, uh, please reach out to coachmenachem at gmail.com. Again, tonight, everything is recorded. It will be available on menachem, www.menachemburnfield.com. If anybody has any questions, please email coachmenachem at gmail.com. Rabbi Manis Friedman, a lot of people are texting. They want to know your website, how to get a hold of you, if you want to put out that information. What's the website again? 
It's good to know.org. Do you have an email people can contact you? Um, not really. Not really. Okay. So if anybody wants to contact It's good to know.org. Good to know.org. Okay. If anybody wants anything, please email Coach Menachem. We will forward it to uh, Rabbi Friedman. Tonight's share, share is number 67. And if anybody wants to listen to this share or any of the previous shirim, please go to our number first, let's call it It's also on our private number we have is 848-777-GROW. That's 848-777-GROW. And I want to thank again our advertising sponsors, The Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi and Yenid from Chazak, Chayla Kaufman and Shmuel Summer from JCN, and Mrs. Mika Sofer from COL Live. And let's go to closing. Coach Menachem, followed by Rabbi Manus Friedman. Coach Menachem, closing words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Um, I, you don't need my askama, but the way I look at it, it was very, very powerful. And um, the, the, the ideas, and I just want to throw out over there that it, it, it takes time to change the way you think. And many uh, have this thought pattern already for years. And tonight we heard different ways of thinking, different ways of looking at things, which sometimes people can, it can be alarming for people if they're not used to it. But after you understand it, you, you do have to be able to say over and over every day, you know, write up the words or Rabbi Friedman, tell us what the words are in the Siddha that you meant. To say it again and again, to be able to think differently, if whatever years, 30, 40 years of thinking one way. And we need to change that. And it does take time. So thank you very much. And I wish everybody that's lochem, it's Hashem. And, and eventually we should all be able to sit with Menuchs and Nefesh, do what we need to do and serve Hashem. Somebody once said to me after a conversation, he said, oh, darn, now there is hope. <laughs> I had made peace already. No hope. I give up. And I go, oh, no, now there's hope. <laughs> yes, habits are very hard to break. But let me end with this little story, little incident. A guy from Minnesota, from our community there, wrote to the Rebbe that he read in the Rebbe's Sichas that you have to serve God with joy. You always have to be happy. He says, but I can't be happy because I am so bad. I can't be happy. The Rebbe writes back, no matter how bad a person is, he should always be happy. It was more or less the Rebbe's letter. The guy writes back to the Rebbe. And he says, Rebbe, if you knew how bad I was, you wouldn't tell me to be happy. So the Rebbe writes back to him. I doubt whether you know how bad you are. And I'm still telling you to be happy. Isn't that an amazing? <laughs> I don't know how bad you are. I don't think you know how bad you are. In other words, you're worse than you think. And I'm still telling you to be happy. Because as bad as you are, to the Ebishta, that's, that's petty. You're a human being with flaws, with faults, with so it doesn't intimidate the Abishta. If you serve him with joy, he will respond with joy. He's not overwhelmed by how bad you are. Only you're overwhelmed. But there's one other thing. Why would the Rebbe assume that he doesn't know how bad he is? Because if you really know how bad you are, you stop being bad. If a person can say, I am so bad, no, and I'm going to stay that way. Okay, you don't know how bad you are. <laughs> You're just bad enough to be in a bad mood. You don't know how bad you are. Because when a person really sees how bad he is, he stops. Nobody, nobody can continue being bad when they see it clearly. So we have this vague idea, I'm, 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 I'm not perfect, I, I make mistakes, I did this, I did that. Just enough to make you miserable, but not enough to stop the behavior. So what does the Rebbe say? That's a pretty messed up condition, no? You should still be happy. 
So here's the bottom line. The antidote to anxiety is happiness, not getting rid of the anxiety. Because <laughs> that just patchkis it up even more. You want to stop being anxious? Then be something else. What? Happy. Be happy that God wants you to be his people. He wants you to be his child. He wants you to serve him, even though you're so messed up. So why are you excited about being messed up when you can be excited about serving him? Get busy serving him. So you're anxious. It's not your only fault. <laughs> like this guy went to the doctor and the doctor told him what you know he has tuberculosis or whatever. He said, I want a second opinion. He said, okay, you're also ugly. <laughs> you want a second opinion? You want to talk about all your faults? They're not impressive. They're not impressive. But the fact that you can serve Hashem, that's awesome. Go for it. Shkoyach, Rabbi Friedman. What a powerful share. Everybody, thank you for coming tonight. We'll see you next week, Sunday night, 10 p.m. Good night, everybody.